So you're running to be a congressman for North Dakota. Um, as you've seen, I'm sure you knew this before the 2016 election, but I think corruption and greed has come to the come up to the surface and the spotlight in this election. So you look at the corruption and the revolving door between banks, lobbyists, federal government, uh, politicians, media. Uh, I see that here. Uh, you could explain it better than I, but for the layman, I'm a little lost why there's over our, such a police force to protect a private company's construction. Right. Why public funds are being used to help this private company's construction. Obviously, if there was significant violence going on or things like that, that would usher, that would, um, you know, we could understand right. state police. But so much resources, so much police force, that's just on the ground. Not, not talking about the helicopters, uh, out-of-state police from Wisconsin, I was told, are in here. Mm -hmm. Can you explain wha what is the relationship between the state government here and this corporation building the pipeline? And if there's any... Thing else uh, on corruption you could shed a light on. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Uh, the state of North Dakota, as a matter of state policy, fosters and wants to promote oil and, oil and gas exploration, development, all that stuff. I mean, I, I realize even, you know, as a Native American uh, candidate, as a, as a human being, that our country is using 20 million barrels of oil per day. And so, our whole economic reality has been has been propped up by the subsidization of a certain economy of a fossil fuel extractive economy but in north dakota what you what we've we've been blindsided here i remember when the bakken wasn't booming that's about the time that we moved back in in 2007 and i don't remember what the price of oil was but i remember that the property values weren't quite what they were this was before the housing crash of 2008 in North Dakota, what I witnessed was the influx of big oil money and how my first layperson's uh, encounter with that was I, I play basketball at the local gym, you know, about three or four times a week. And with, within the time that the Bakken started booming, I noticed that a lot of oil workers, oil lobbyists, there was a lot of oil money coming in and property values were skyrocketing. Little old ladies are getting kicked out of their leases in western North Dakota and being forced to move, you know, east to Bismarck, where I was living. And this was, and this was because of pipelines being built along the Balkans? Uh, just uh, mostly man camps, just general development. It was like the Wild West out here in, in those days. But what we, what, we, what we were witness to is that oil money began to infiltrate or begin to uh, just invade politics. All of a sudden, every politician, mostly the Republicans, uh, were being funded by big oil. Uh, oil packs were created, a petroleum council was revived, and our, my, can, my opponent, ha not only is he accepting Koch brother money, but he's accepting, uh, all, he's almost, I would say, 80% funded by big oil. That's not just my opponent. That's the other Senate candidate, John Hoven. That's the governor, Dalrymple, uh, uh, Jack Dalrymple. This, the whole state has forgotten its roots. Like our roots here as North Dakotans are with agriculture. They're with farming. They're with ranching. They're with, with hard work, even a growing technology sector. But what's interesting about North Dakota is we don't have an enforceable ethics commission, meaning that my opponent, when he served on the Public Service Commission, which permits all the pipelines, all the utilities in North Dakota, accepted donations, big donations, from the very people, the very companies that he was supposed to regulate. Now, this is going on across the board. They're all accepting donations. They're all being wined and dined by the very industries that they're supposed to regulate. Now. You, instinctively, you can't bite the hand that feeds you. You don't want to bite the hand that feeds you. You want this little cycle to perpetuate itself. For me, as an attorney, if, if I did what my opponent is doing, if I accepted donations from people that I was expected to objectively regulate, that would be 
a textbook conflict of interest. If not that, at the very least, it's unethical. It should not be happening. Now, this is just for the state of North Dakota. For the federal side, I mean, we, we know that system as well. Look who caused the, the housing crash of 2008. That, that bailout costed, um, costed the taxpayers $700 billion. And we see big money, big extraction, big pharma, too big to fail. Everything has completely hijacked our democracy. And we're, we're part of that movement. Young Turks is part of that movement. Bernie was finally a guy who spoke the truth. And for all of us outside, all of us who've been feeling this way for years, we're like, wow, somebody's willing to tell it like it is. Somebody's willing to speak the truth on mainstream media against, you know, too big to fail everything on behalf of the people who government is supposed to serve. Government is not supposed to serve too big to fail in, in, in big money. But it is right now. That's actually why uh, I even went to my first district caucus in North Dakota was because I wanted to become a Bernie delegate. I went there, ended up meeting other people, and uh, here I am now running for Congress. I think what's interesting is you were describing uh, your governor who, if, you're not, if you don't say it, I'll just say it. I mean, that's just blatant corruption, uh, what, you're, what you're describing. I, I thought there were rules against owning shares in companies as an elected <laughs> official, but I guess not in North Dakota. Um, but you broaden that out to the federal level and President Obama, uh, who a lot of people credited with halting the pipeline. And for people who haven't been paying attention uh, or don't know a lot, they thought that meant, oh, the whole thing has been stopped. They didn't realize it was only a small corridor um, and that injunction has been lifted. But even the Democrats get take big money from oil and uh, have this philosophy that uh, we have to do these pipelines to be self-sufficient and this and that. It seems like whether it's the state level or the federal level, uh, the basic concept of humanity and people's cultures and uh, rights to live, to right. drink, to be safe, doesn't seem to be uh, that prevalent anymore in, in the executive branch or, or the Congress that you're trying to get into. That's, that's, I, I, I agree with that. You know, what's really, what was disheartening me is Trump. Trump. Trump is on a burning train. That train is headed for a cliff. But with all these WikiLeaks disclosures, you, you see now that, you know, the emperor has no clothes, even our own party. I hope you've been reading mine because I've been reporting heavily. Okay, <laughs> awesome. You can see that Citigroup was telling Obama who was going to be high-level appointees before Obama even won. And so we're at a point where, as Americans, we're, this is gut-check time. We, we all need to think about you know, what the future of our country looks like and who our government answers to. It's, it's, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to believe that two, a two-party system or that politicians are not slimy. And I, I don't come from that tradition of leadership that where you can be slimy. You know what I mean? We're self-accountable to our people. And so that's that's the hard that's going to be one of the hardest things to do is to get elected without selling out. But I don't I can't sell out. I just don't it's not in my blood. I don't know how to do that. You know what I mean? And so I have to run a race where I'm reaching out to people and just showing them really who I am and, and that I I want to represent them. But for our country, um, we just need to be we need to be more transparent. We need, actually, we need to be more proactive, especially all the people who came out during, uh, during Bernie's run. You know, I felt, I felt bad for Bernie because Bernie was trying to tell all of us, okay, you guys, let's jump on board with Hillary now. And I was in that ballroom at the DNC when nobody was feeling that. I mean, they, they booed the dog out of Bernie when he suggested that. And I think at that point, he must have realized, OK, this is this is bigger than than just Bernie. You know what I mean? Like oh, he, he says that all along. But that was a moment where I thought this is this is the time for us, time for the people. Time, everybody has a voice. You know what I mean? Everybody has a, a role to play. And look, I'm, I'm voting for Hillary. But I'm not I, just, I can't defend her. I can't 
I'm not trying to get her endorsement. I'm not. I'm not out stumping for her. I just. I can't do that right now. I would. I. I like Jill too. But, I mean, I. I. I just feel it's. it's there's a risk there, and maybe there's a little bit of fear factor there or whatever. But, I feel we have a better chance of making Hillary progressive, because she. She did a world tour. Trying to promote the TPP. And now she's in front of us telling that she doesn't. She doesn't support the TPP. Obama won't back off the TPP, and it's it's the new NAFTA. I mean, we just need to reclaim re- reclaim our democracy. Yeah, I have to disagree with you there. I uh, think there's a better chance of me, who can't even hook up a TV, building a yurt, than us making her progressive. But <laughs> I, re- I respect your views. Um, I wanted to ask, North Dakota is fairly Republican, from what I hear. Uh, how is... Uh, I would think that someone with the nickname Iron Eyes, um, a native, uh, is quite the underdog to win Congress. Can you kind of talk to me about your race? Uh, I know that you, you said your opponent uh, is pretty much in bed with the oil companies. Uh, what's the response you've gotten so far? Um, and obviously, I'm assuming you're not taking special interest money, but uh, talk to me about uh, what, what you feel your chances are uh, a month away and uh, your experience so far. That's a good question. I think uh, my opponent comes from from a different time in politics. When when you just you could take big money and buy TV ads, and your race was safe. What's his name? Uh, Kevin Kramer. But now with social media, now with independent media sources, uh, the landscape is is completely changing. And Kevin Kramer, as Trump's energy advisor, because he's a climate denier, he won't back away from his support of Trump, even though Trump is continuing to tank just further and further. So there's that that little aspect that could help me. I'm relying on, on the North Dakota women's vote, uh, North, the Native American vote. Natives make up, uh, could potentially be 50 to 70,000 votes in a state where 165,000 votes would give me the victory. In, in North Dakota, you know, we have, we've been, we've been integrated for a long time. But we've also lived worlds apart, and so uh, the Indian thing and the white people thing is a real thing in the Northern Plains. The Northern Plains are, uh, they've, they've got that, we've got our own characteristics as, as a demographic in America. It's not like the places uh, where, where any metro, metropolitan area where nobody really cares what race you are or what color your skin is. It doesn't really raise uh, any issues whatsoever. Uh, and I didn't know this until I moved to Denver, because when you grow up out here, um, it's a real thing. You know what I mean? The, the, the racial uh, things that we've got to think of, they're, they're, they're real considerations. Um, but in my race, what I've found is that, because I'm the first Native American to run for United States Congress in North Dakota, and people, the sentiment that I get is it's about time. Like it's it's about time because of the the nature of this state being dominated by Tea Party type Republicans. I mean, Trump is going to win this state. There's a certain type of re- Republican that is like a reasonable Republican who wants fiscal conservativeness and all that stuff. I get that, but that's that's not our state right now. Um, but the the Democratic Party, which has its roots in something called the Nonpartisan League, that's a whole nother story about farmers and ranchers and working people standing up to outside exploitation we have a history of that we built this is the only state-owned bank in the country the the bank of north dakota we have a state-owned grain mill that our party is responsible for but our party gets their tail kicked because of that the there's a backlash for from national dems liberal is a bad word out here uh people villainize obama out here when Obama got elected and the, the rise of the Tea Party was underway, Sarah Palin became a real thing. That's when the Democratic Nonpartisan League began to lose its seats here in North Dakota. Even a little bit sooner than that. But what I'm trying to get, it, get at is that there are alliances that need to be made between tribal nations, Native American people, and Democratic Nonpartisan Leaguers in North Dakota. Because we're, we're all on the same page it's just that we've existed. We have separate sovereignties. People, you know, Indian people don't usually care about state or federal politics. They care about their own politics, 
tribal elections, but we've got to we've got to expand out of that and, and just kind of take our place and make our voice be heard on every level of government or or in any venue in our country. And uh, lastly, I heard a rumor that uh, you could explain money and corruption through a Wu Tang Wu Tang quote. That's crazy. Yes, cash rules everything around me. That's right. I've been that's crazy. I've been a Wu Tang fan since 1993. I was in high school when they first came out, and uh, I really, you know, growing up out here in North Dakota. Look, when, look what I'll tell you a quick story. When I grew up, right, I had this auntie, and she was a white lady, and I didn't see her as a white lady. She was just my aunt. You know what I mean? That was my uncle's wife, and she raised me part of my life in, in as a young kid. But she had an old record player, and on that record player, she listened to George Jones, Buck Owens, uh, Randy Travis, Boxcar Willie, uh, Hank Williams Sr., um, Johnny Horton, like these old country singers, before, way before even the old country guys that are alive today, before Willie Nelson even. And uh, But growing up on the reservation, there's an element of of imposed poverty culture where you recognize when other art forms are speaking about that. And so we begin, we were, I was part of the hip hop generation on the res who were listening to public enemy, beastie boys, Kumo D all the, all those old artists when everybody had those yellow Sony cassette tape Walkmans. And then it graduated into, you know, hip hop. And we found a form of expression there. My young son, he, he, he raps right now. He, he freestyles right now. And, uh, <laughs> so our casino brings a lot of old artists out here so maybe when Wu-Tang's like 55 years old we'll get them out here but mm -hmm. until then I don't even I, I haven't even delved into the modern hip-hop world I like that old school though yeah Wu-Tang had a lot of uh, foresight because I do think cash rules everything uh, where could people find more information about you if they want to support you uh, tell them where to find you Yes, uh, you can always find me on, on social media at Chase Iron Eyes. That's my Twitter handle uh, on Instagram at Iron Eyes for Congress. Chase Iron Eyes under my name on Facebook or Iron Eyes for Congress. Uh, Iron Eyes for Congress dot US. Um, and we've always, you know, uh, we, we've also, we, we also support independent media. We, we really, I love what you're doing, man. I, I love the Young Turks. When I walked into a little small town, in uh, uh, North Dakota, it was called Wapton, North Dakota. It's one of our bigger towns, but it's a, you know probably like 30,000 people, 40,000 people. I walk in there at midnight, and there's a, there's a kid about 22 years old working behind the cash register. He says, Chase Iron Eyes, what are you doing here, man? He was like, have the Young Turks supported you yet? Are you about that wolf pack? This is little, like a 22-year-old kid at midnight in a small town in North Dakota. He knows what Young Turks are. He knows what the wolf pack is. And so he's asking me about that. He's like, I want to support you. How do I help out? How do we get you elected? I think we're, we're witnessing a, a changing of the guard right now, not just in North Dakota, because North Dakota kind of has that, that sleepy feeling, like, you know, not a lot happens here. It's like out in the sticks out here, which is, which is fine. I mean, we like it out in the sticks, but on, on the national level and on the world level, we're just witnessing something beautiful, something powerful happening people are beginning to liberate themselves they're beginning to say hey this is our country like we have a stake in this even though we for the longest time politics was for old white males now it's like you know women uh everybody everybody else who's not represented in that demographic is taking their place and making their voices heard and i think it's awesome i mean it's 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 our story as americans it's we're creating the new fabric for the 21st century america right now Thanks so much for your time, man. Good yeah, luck. Thank you. Yep.